probably be the last couple of months I've been chewing on and going back over some fundamental basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, grace, justification, the foundations. And I think that it is important as a believer, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how long you've been carrying the bloodstained banner, I think that it is important that you go back every now and then and uh, uh, strengthen your foundation. Amen. And so this morning, I've got something good for you I want to share. For the last couple of months, I've been chewing on this, been sharing it with my wife. We were on our way to Kansas City a couple of months ago, and I was talking to her about the simple grace of God and the doctrine of justification and these fundamental principles that, that a lot, we don't hear about them a lot anymore, and just the simplicity of the love of God and what Jesus did on the cross. And we both was in, on the highway driving, face wetter, wetter than wet, crying and weeping over the fact that he loves us to the degree and the magnitude that he does. And, and we, we begin to discuss and dialogue and go through the scriptures about how complicated down through the years we have made the gospel and we have made the love of Jesus Christ. But I feel it evangelistic anointing on me this morning. And so I hope that this will bless you. Let's go to the word. We're going to start at Romans chapter three, just for a second. But the meat of what we're going to teach from is going to be from the fourth chapter. If you can, if you've got a device that can transfer it, I want you to follow me in the New Living Translation. In the New Living Translation, I'm going to cut this. But listen, if you have not taken the time to read the book of Romans, if you if it's been a while, if you've kind of cher cherry picked Romans, I want to challenge you as we prepare for this new year to go back and read Romans. Don't read it in King James. Don't read it in New King James. I want you to read the book of Romans in a very simple translation because I believe that there is a lot that we are missing about the gospel in the book of Romans. And I'm going to give you just a piece of what I've been looking at, been studying, and I know that it's going to bless you. All right. This is Romans chapter three. We're going to jump right into this thought. I hate to do it, but the meat of what I want to deal with again is Romans four. If you're typing on the screen, if you can do two things at once, uh, type in the comments, Romans chapter three. Then we're going to go into Romans four. This is Romans three. Let's start at verse 19. Again, I hate to jump into this, but I want you to read this in, in entirety on your own time. If you want a Bible reading plan, if you want something to study, I want you to study with me the book of Romans. It'll bless your life. This is Romans 3, 19. It says, obviously, the law applies to those whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. The second part says, and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. Did you hear what he just said? He said that the law applies to those who have it been given. For its purpose, the purpose of the law is to keep people from having excuses and to show them that the entire world is guilty before God. Verse 20 says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Now, there's a couple of statements that you're going to hear me make by way of the scripture this morning that are going to rattle your chain, that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. If you have grown up in legalism, if you've grown up uh, in the traditional holiness church, if you've grown up in the strict Pentecostal church, some of what I'm getting ready to teach, some of what we're getting ready to read this morning is going to cause a dissonance. It's going to cause uh, a ruffling of your feathers because what I'm finding out is some of what I've been taught by by the people of God, not intentionally, but unintentionally for me. I'm going to talk a second. It has really messed with my relationship with the Father, that what was taught and how it was taught is that I'm going through the scriptures about my foundation in God. What I'm finding is that people taught their personal uh, consecration. And so if you're a preacher and you are watching this, be careful not to teach your personal consecration. Your personal consecration is not to be preached to the masses, but we are to keep this gospel simple. And I'm telling you, down through the years, we have made this thing extremely complicated. 
And what we're getting ready to find in the scripture is that this is simple. What is the objective this morning as we go to Romans 4? What is the objective? Heaven's objective this morning is to call you out of a place of inner turmoil with the Lord. I spoke on a Tuesday night. We talked about a place of rest or a place of prophetic rest. That is when you on the inside are settled and you are at peace and there is no fight on the inside. God is desperately, before we move from 2020 into 2021, your first step out of the bed into a new year, he wants you to be in a place of rest. Somebody say, in him. Say it again, in him. Say it in him, in him, in him. The Bible says that those that know their God shall be strong. Those that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And so how this relates, what we're getting ready to investigate this morning to the vision of the gates of refuge, to the vision of your life, to the vision of your local assembly is that we cannot. One of the last things Bishop said to us in the in the real sanctuary before we went online only was that God was preparing the body of Christ and he was preparing the gates of refuge so that we could be whole, we could be at a place of health, and we could be in a place of settled on the inside so that when God brings the harvest, that we would know how to handle them because we've been healed ourselves. And if you're listening, listening to me this morning, I want you to understand this, that you cannot give a grace that you do not believe belongs to you. I got to say that again. You better write that in your notes that you cannot extend a grace that you have not received yourself. <laughs> and so what we're finding is, is that many of us that have been in the church for years, I'm listening, I've been having conversations all week and in, in weeks prior about the simplicity of the gospel and why in certain reformations and certain movements, um, there's such a hardness and why there is not a harvest of souls coming in to be saved. If you are a believer, I want you to ask yourself, when is the last time that I've led someone to the Lord? I want you to ask yourself a question. When was the last time that you shared the gospel to a point that a person became free by what you said? When was the last time that you administered the love and the goodness and the grace of God to a person that when they left your presence, they felt freer, they felt uh, lighter, they felt like they could run on to see what the end is going to be? Because I'm telling you that, that if you do not believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, if you don't believe that it is by grace through faith, then you cannot extend that to someone. Woo! And so there are people in your family that need the love of God, but we have failed to administer it to the degree that it needs to be administered because we can't give a love that we don't believe uh, we have received. Oh, it's getting ready to get good this morning. Let's go. Romans 4. This is going to be plain Jane, but I promise you, if you hear what the Spirit is saying this morning, this is going to bless your socks. I hope you got a pedicure because your socks are coming out this morning. This is Romans 4 and 1. I'm going to read this until we get to the 16th verse, and then we're going to talk for a moment. Let me say this. I was, I'll tell you my little story. I was um, a student. Was I, still, no, I, was, I was in middle school. And um, I was hungry for the presence of the Lord. I'm a church baby. And so I just always claim salvation. Uh, I went up to sit in the chair. I got baptized young. And uh, you, like me, like many of us, we gave our life to the Lord, not really fully understanding what all that entailed, what all of the benefits were. And so if you are like me, you heard more of what you couldn't do, more than what your ability was with the spirit of the Lord's help after you give your life to him. And so I'm, I'm a young man, young boy at this time. I'm hungry for the presence of the Lord. And, and uh, but, but uh, I was a little nasty. You, you understand? And so I remember being hungry for the presence of the Lord and a revival came to my small little town in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, the, the minister, the apostle that was running the revival, his name was Apostle A.S. Johnson. 
And he came to town and he ran this revival. And I had never been in the presence of the Lord that thick before ever in my entire life. I, the presence of the Lord came in that, that small little shotgun church. The benches were wooden. The floor was wood. It was old. It was one of them kind of church. Just a small holiness church. And I remember the presence of the Lord getting so high that no one in the building could stand. It was one of them gates of refuge services. But but it was before I found the movement of the spirit that moves through the gates. But this ministry, this revival that came in my town was a breath of fresh air for me. And I remember um, a, a, a first lady coming over to me where I was at. I was weeping. I was broken before the Lord because I was I had a weakness but I did not want that weakness to separate me from God. And so all through my middle school years, all through my high school years, I want you to hear me. I was in extreme turmoil about where I sat and where me and God was in spite of my weakness. When I said your boy was nasty, I mean, your boy was just a little, just a little young, uh, just, just, yeah, no, just nasty. And so my relationship with God, I loved him. I believed that he loved me, but I wasn't sure. And so I want to tell you this, that many of you, says the Spirit of the Lord, have forfeited your call. You have sat on your gift. You have delayed your purpose because you have disqualified yourself from God using and moving through you. Did you hear what I just said? That you have disqualified. The first conversation I had with Bishop when I first met him, he asked me to preach. And, and at this time in my life, I'm still in turmoil about where, in, where me and God are at because of what's going on on the inside of me. And Bishop Johnson said, I want you to preach the next time you come to Tulsa. I don't know this man. I ain't never seen him before, before this Sunday. And he said, I want you to preach. And I said, I can't do it. No, uh -uh, I, ain't, I ain't about to preach up in here. And he said, why not? He said, is it God holding you up or is it you? you? He said, you, do you know that you're called to preach? I said, yes, from my mother's womb. It's been prophesied that I would preach the gospel. He said, well, why aren't you doing it? And I said, well, I don't know. So he said, well, then I'll give you a date. You'll, you'll preach June 12th, Sunday, June 12th. I said, no. He said, so then it is not God that has you on hold. It's you that has you on hold, that has the next phase of your ministry, that has the next phase of your life, that has the next phase of your purpose on hold. Help me hear God. I'm about to read Romans 4. But listen to me. It was because of a, of a, of a bad doctrine that I was taught. Let's go to Romans 4. So listen, this, this pastor's wife comes to lay hands on me and I lift my hands and I cry to the point that I get dehydrated and I tell the Lord, yes, and I'm asking him to help me. I'm asking him to restore me, to take, if there's anything like it, that's, if there's anything that's not like it, that's within me, take it out right now. So I prayed the prayer. I'm sincere. I'm asking God to help me. Me and my little girlfriend were just getting it on morning, noon and night, but I loved God, but this thing kept pulling me. And so that service was over. Fast forward to when I get to Tulsa, there's still this conflict between me and God. And I want to know, where do we stand? Are you mad at me? Do you love me? And, I, and, and as I thought, as the Lord took me to Romans 4 and I started studying the grace of God and the love of God and righteousness and justification by faith, I came upon this and my socks came off of my feet. This is where we started crying in the car because of how simple the love of God is. Let's read Romans 4 and 1. This says Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds, listen to me, church, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about, talking about Abraham. But that was not God's way. Verse 3 says, for the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Woo, God, I got to stop here. God counted Abraham righteousness, not because of anything that he did, but because of his faith. Woo, I'm, uh, the spirit of the Lord this morning is going to call you out of a works-based relationship 
with the Lord. Our prayer time is too convoluted with a hope with, with sin consciousness. This, um, the Lord said to me the other day, my people, there's a group of them that are unsure if I want them blessed. Because what we have been taught is that you become righteous by what you do, by works of the flesh. And so how long you pray, how long you fast, how, how hard you shout, if you are a worshiper, if you are a praiser. But what this is saying is that God counted Abraham as righteous or justified, not because of anything that he did, but because of his faith. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Let's keep going. Verse four says, when people, listen to this because it gets simpler. When people work, their wages are not a gift. Oh, I got help for you. But something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work. Not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Told you it's going to be evangelistic. But even us in the church that have been saved, some of us still don't believe that it's a finished work, that God uh, has not changed his mind about us because of sin, because of weakness, because of imperfection. I'm telling you, when I read this, all I could do was weep because I remember being a young boy and I, and I wish somebody would have took me to Romans 4 to explain to me, you are, you are, you are tormenting yourself. I wanted to know the first prophetic word I got when I came to the, oh God, Lord, don't have me on here crying. The first prophetic word that I got when I moved to Tulsa, the first service at the Gates of Refuge in that little hotel room, Bishop Johnson, he ministered to me. And, 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 and I need to explain this to you because it wrecked my entire life. He, I was, listen, you got to understand, I was in this time, in this space in my life where I did not know if God was mad at me or not. I did not know if if, if God was going to, to, to kill me dead because I was a freak, but I loved him. And so what church did, oh God, what the church did is that they, I was afraid, listen, of being sat down. And so I thought that if I moved on and someone found out that they was going, and I wanted to keep playing drums. So what I did in an attempt to not be sat down, what I did was I became a professional hider. So I need, to, I need to take, just because that you are avoiding something doesn't mean that you're delivered from it. Can y'all put that in the comment? Oh, God. And so, oh, I got a whole lot to say, but I got a short time to say it. And so listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I, I was tormented because I thought that God was upset with me. And so I spent the majority of, of the majority of my young manhood afraid of the presence of the Lord because I did not know where me and him stood. Loved him, the sinner's prayer, I, all of that. But I wish somebody would have took me to Romans 4 to tell me that it's not by works. Whew, I got to keep reading. Listen, verse 4 says, when people work, their wages are not a gift but something that they have earned. Verse five says, but people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God. Listen, it is God. It is God who forgives sin. This gets better. Verse six says, David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. If you grew up in the strict holiness, the strict Pentecostal, <laughs> oh, God, what, what we were taught is that you obtain righteousness by what you abstain from, that you obtain it by what you did, by how long you prayed, by how much you fasted, by if you came to, to, to all of the midweek stuff they had going on, that your relationship and your right standing with God was based on something that you did. It gets better. Verse seven says, oh, what joy of those whose disobedience is forgiven. This is the Bible. I can't make this up. Whose sins are put out of sight. Verse eight says, yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared from sin. I got just a little bit more for you. 
Verse 9 says, now is the blessing only for the Jews. Hear me. This, this is going to make sense in a second. He says, now is this blessing only for the Jews or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. Verse 10 says, but how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after, listen, 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 only after he was circumcised? The second part says, clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Are y'all getting this? Is this clear to you? What this is saying is that God counted Abraham righteous before the act of the ceremony. He didn't do anything to receive right standing with God other than believe. Other than believe. Listen, verse 11 says, circumcision was a sign that Abraham had already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. Last part. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. Oh my God. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. Listen to me. This is why the enemy fights our faith so hard. I, I, the, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, that it's by grace. Woo! It's by grace. Through faith, we are saved. The next part of that says, not of works. Oh my God. How many times have we heard that salvation is by what you abstain from doing. I'm not giving, I'm not, I can't give nobody a license to sin, but, but I'm telling you that we've got this thing backwards, that we are around here in, and so listen, this is why, this is why the believer, the sinner runs away from the presence of the Lord when they've fallen, when they've made a mistake. Some of you, uh, when you leave God, when you, when you stay away from the community of believers, you do it because you believe, you believe and it has been taught that God is upset. But when you understand that your right standing with God is by faith, when you get in trouble, instead of running from him, you can run to him. What am I saying this morning? That we have wasted too much time in inner conflict and in inner turmoil uh, uh, with God about how he, I want to settle the argument. Say it in the comments. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, it, it, the, the, the dilemma is this. That if you believe that you can earn righteousness, the Bible says that our righteousness, these scriptures are going to start making more sense now. Our righteousness is as a field. I wish I had a pad in here. Lord Jesus, our righteousness is as a filthy rag on your best day. Woo! On your non-horniest day, on your non-road rage day, on your non-hangriest day, on your non-attitude, on your non-alcoholic day, on your non-we, you, your, your righteousness and my righteousness is still compared in the eyes of God as a minstrel pad. I'm just trying to tell you something that's going to be up here. The just, listen to me, the just shall live by faith. I got one more story to tell and wrap up. We'll finish this another time. I was at the same space in my life. The same space in my life. I was leading, I think I told y'all this in March. I was leading a small group called Campus Crusade for Christ on my campus. And, and I was teaching, but I was also struggling. <laughs> I was also having a hard time, young, single, uh, uh, testosterone-filled young man. And so I'm trying to do the will of the Lord uh, and keep myself together at the same time. And so I'm feeling like a hypocrite. I'm feeling like God is mad. I'm feeling like the gig is about to be up because I'm a fake and a fraud. But I'm working through my uh, 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 shortcomings. I'm, I'm working through my flesh and I'm trying to get the flesh crucified and get it under control. And so listen. There was a young man who he was actually the 
uh, the leader over that chapter for the Campus Crusade for Christ Christian Ministry on this small community college campus. And uh, the people who ran that ministry right before I came in, they quit and they started to do something else off campus. And I did not want to see this small, um, what I saw to be a, a very potentially um, l not lucrative, what's the word I'm looking for? Potent. Uh, I thought God was going to move extremely well and strong through the, and he did. And so I did not want to see it go south. And so I said, I'll take it. And so they brought a representative from the Campus Crusade for Christ to meet with me to make sure that my doctrine was right. Now, listen, I'm going to say this and I'm gone. I come from the Holiness Church. And so the Holiness Church, uh, that is, is they preach that the wages of sin is death. They left off the next part of that, which 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 trumps the which 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 is better than the first part. Yes, the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God, oh God, the gift of God, it's something we did not. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. You opened uh, yesterday gifts. Some of you that you deserve, but most of them you did because you've been clowning all year. But it was a gift. So this this preacher. He comes to sit down with me in a private conference room. He says, hey, I want to thank you for joining our team. I want to thank you for um, doing Bible study weekly. I just want to go over with you the plan of salvation so that those that are coming to your meetings, as they start getting saved, that we can disciple them properly. and We can lead them to the Lord properly. I said, all right. So he brought this paper to me. And it was the plan of salvation on this little clean. And I said, all right. Now, listen, I'm in sin. And I don't know anything about Romans 4 because I was taught it was it was holiness or hell. But they never taught us how to live holy, what that entailed, how we accomplish a state of holiness. That's a whole nother message. So listen, in short, he says to me, he takes me to Ephesians 2 and 8. For, gra for by grace, through faith, we're saved, not of works, lest any man should bow, for it is the free. He talked about the free gift of God. And I said, well, wait a minute. Where is you got to live right? <laughs> Where is I don't see holiness or hell anywhere in, in men of God in your little in your little pamphlet. And he said, Well, that's we're talking about salvation. And I said, Well, where's live what where's live right? Now on my laptop in my room at that very moment, I mean the point is just down, it's just wait, just 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 hot porn ready. And but I'm saying, but I'm fighting him. On a gospel that I need. Told you I was tormented. I, I'm in conflict about me and God. But this, 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 this God is sending this preacher to show me in the word that how I'm going about, how I'm going about it, I got it all backwards. He says, it is the free gift of God. You believe with your believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, you are saved. I said, no, nah, I can't. I can't buy. He, so we started arguing. He said, sir, it's right here in the scripture. What is there to argue about? We left that meeting. I almost quit that, quit that ministry because I could, the legalist in me and the self-righteousness in me could not bring myself to understand that God was not mad at me. Woo! -hoo. I'm going to give you one statement, and I got to close this video off. I, I, we got to go. Sin, and I and I need to. I need you to get everything that I'm getting ready to say. Sin. If you cut sin open inside of an individual, there is a need. There is a need. And so what happens, what the enemy's job is, is to cover this need with sin and to surround you and I with people that can only see the sin or the wrapping of this need to be distracted by what the real root of the problem is. Woo! <laughs> And so what, what happened in my upbringing is that, is that what was underneath the sin was that there was pain, that I was looking for connectivity. I was looking for uh, um, affirmation. But because uh, many of us grew up in a works-based culture, 
it was holiness or hell, but that was the end of the conversation. That, that ministry stopped there. I fought this man for about an hour and a half because I refused to believe that God was not upset. I refused to believe that I was saved. I, I refused to believe it, but on the inside of my heart, I needed to believe it. But because of what I was taught, because of what I saw, because of what I, I observed, I said, it can't be that simple. It's got to be more to it. I want you to know that the spirit of the Lord is telling you that you cannot earn, you can't work your way into salvation. Mm. You, you can't, I want to call you out of striving in a performance-based relationship with the Lord. Yes, hell is real. Yes, yes, sin, all of that. But this morning, the spirit of the Lord wants to call you out of a place of inner turmoil. There is somebody watching me this morning that your relationship with the Lord, you have walked away from it. And the spirit of the Lord says, come back, be loving. God wants to do something in your faith. There is too much in you. There is too much to accomplish in this up and coming year for you to be struggling and, and, and in doubt and in debate about where God viewed you, how God views you. I want you to type it one more in the comments and say, I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, say it again. Listen, the man who was on the cross with Jesus, he said, I believe. He said, I believe. He wasn't baptized. Jesus didn't lay hands on him. He didn't shout. There was no altar for him to come up to. But he said, he said, I believe. He said, this day, Jesus said, this day, because of you believe, this day you'll be with me in paradise. We didn't make this thing complicated. Got to make this thing simple again. I want you to finish reading Romans on your own time. I had to start where I stopped at for the sake of time, but this is deep, but it is so simple. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray with you that that God begins to, listen, I got to say this, and the reason why some of this, this is difficult to comprehend, because many of us grew up in households and in families that you were only uh, accepted by way of your performance. So if you perform well, then you're accepted, but if you did something wrong, there was this shunning, there was this avoidance, there was this cut you off, but I'm telling you that that is not the love of God. And so as we're saved now, and as we have accepted the Lord in our life, there's still this inner turmoil because we're trying to perform our way into right standing with the Lord. And I'm telling you, nothing that you can do in your flesh can change uh, God's view of you. Whoop! Hey! Hallelujah! Let's pray. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Let's pray. Father, I give you the glory. I thank you and I praise you. Father, I'm asking this morning that you would take us back to the basics. You want to do something in our foundation. You want to do something in the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our relationship with you. And I give you the glory now that as we uh, dive into this, as, as, as you peel back the layers and the levels of legalism and, and religiosity, I thank you, Father, that we are going to see you and to come to know you in a whole new way. Won't you wash? Hey, won't you wash us over again? Oh, come on, lift your hands wherever you are and say that old prayer. Say, Father, if there be anything that's in me, and we know that there is, that is not like you, any mindset that is keeping us from the next, any mindset, any thought process that is keeping those who are around us from receiving what you've put in us. Father, I thank you and I praise you. I give you glory that you would adjust it, that you would, that you would correct it, that you would reveal it. I thank you that there is somebody that is in turmoil, that there is someone who has backslidden, there is someone who is watching this video that have left fellowship with the Spirit because you were taught a works-based salvation. I pray this morning, Father, that you would reach out your hand. Your word says, with love and kindness have I drawn thee. Father, I thank you this morning that not one individual, that not one individual that would hear this word 
Mm. That it would fall on deaf ears, but that it would fall on good ground. I thank you. And I give you the glory that the adversary cannot steal this word. Yeah. We come against the spirit of religion. Mm. Hey. We call you out of stress and strife and a performance with God. And I give you praise, Father, that we are getting ready to experience the greatest freedom. The, the Bible said where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Father, give your people a, a greater liberty than we ever have before in you. Somebody say in Jesus name. I want to put this footnote in there. Romans also says, shall we continue in sin that the grace of God may abound? God forbid. I want you to investigate that. That's your homework this week. Before the next time we see each other, I want you to go to the scripture and I want you to search that out. Shall we continue in sin? What is he talking about? The grace of God. And you'll find something that is very powerful. Very life-changing for your walk with the Lord. Shall we continue in seeing that the, the grace of God shall abound? He says, God forbid, or certainly not. The grace of God is the solution. Is the solution to our sin. I'm telling you, it's the way out. Yeah. Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to give this morning. I hope that you were blessed. I hope that this simple word impacted you. I hope that this simple word is going to take you on a journey to go back and look at the foundation of your faith. It's, just, it's a lot of stuff that's been good that's been put in us, but there's some, there's some negative, there's some bad, there's some bad doctrine, and I'm telling you that it will mess with your current, that the, that the error that we know, it will affect us in our now. I want you to give grace to somebody. I want you to administer this week the love of Jesus Christ to somebody who you feel don't deserve it. You will receive mercy if you can give mercy. Woo, hallelujah. I want you to prepare your heart this morning to give. I want you to prepare your heart to give. I was asking the Lord the other day about giving and what he wanted me to say, if anything, as it pertains to giving. And he told me to tell you two things this morning. He said the first, he said, tell my people that some of them are eating their seed, eating it. I said, what do you mean? He said, literally eating it. Take out food. He said, he said that they are giving what belongs to the house of God and what belongs to the, king, to the kingdom of God. They're giving it to Starbucks. They're giving it to Popeye. They're giving it to Zoe's. They're giving it uh, uh, to these fast. Listen, do not, don't spend your seed on clothes. Don't spend what belongs to the Lord on food. Put what belongs to the Father in the ground, in the ground. I keep telling you every week and week out that those that are prospering in this hour, if you check their giving record, those are the givers. The givers God has sustained, and I do not want you to miss out on what God is doing in the next season. If you're watching this video and you are a part of the Gates of Refuge, I'm, I'm challenging you. Some of y'all have been playing possum, but I'm challenging every giver. I know what yes, day before was, yesterday was my birthday, but the day before yesterday was Christmas. I'm challenging you. God would not ask you for it if you did not have it. Every Gates of Refuge member that is watching me this morning to get a hundred dollar. Y'all think that we just saying a hundred dollars just because it's a nice round number. But there is something in the hundred dollar seed that as you release it, it opens up a level for you. Some of you have far succeeded a tithe or offering of a hundred dollars and you in the five hundred dollar. Some of you, God is positioning you for the thousand dollar seed. Everything that is happening in our household, my personal household right now, it is a result of the seeding that God has led us to give. It's hard this time, and I'm telling you that that same season, be it unto you. The Lord told us Tuesday that the season of scarcity, you remember that? You remember it? You remember it? The season of scarcity was over, and I'm telling you for the believer and for the giver, it's getting ready to be the best season that you ever have experienced 
in your life. God prospered you in the middle. We got to keep saying in the middle. In the middle of a pandemic, while all hell was breaking loose, he still sustained you. And I'm telling you that the principle of giving, it works, but you must work it. If you have been inconsistent in your sowing, if you've been hitting and missing, I want you this morning to take a moment and to repent, to change your mind and to not miss another moment in your giving. You can start the first of the year off in consistency and discipline and believing God that when your harvest comes back, listen, if you hit and miss in your giving, when it comes back, it's going to come back in the manner that it was given. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It, it, it doesn't just apply to money, but, but please believe that it applies to whatever it is that you release from your life. When you give it inconsistently, when it comes back, the flow is going to be the way that you gave it back, inconsistent. If you don't like the flow, if you don't like the financial flow, that is happening in your life, if it's choppy, if there's a lot of intermittent time in between you sowing it and when it comes back, I want to challenge you to check your discipline and your consistency in your seated. Woo! This is good this morning. I want you to know that if you would give by the leading of the Spirit, God would make sure that everything that you need financially, everything that you need that pertains to you, it would always be there. It would always be there. God loves a cheerful giver in your seating and in your offering. So listen, this morning, you can give by way of the cash app or you can give online. Either one of those mess, excuse me, either one of those methods will do. If you go, if you're going to give in the cash app, it's simply gates of Refuge. If you if you're not on Cash App, if you don't use that methodology, you can go online to gatesofrefuge.com, dot square, dot site, and you can get any amount. If you are outside of the Tulsa, Oklahoma area, and you have been following our ministry, you've been blessed by it. Maybe you're not a member. Maybe you're just passing through. And this morning, last Tuesday, Tuesday before last. You have been blessed by what comes forth out of this ministry. I want to give you an opportunity to give any amount of your choosing by the leading of your spirit. There's some tech, tech equipment that we need. And I believe that someone is going to simply ask us, how much do y'all need to take it to another level? And we already got the number. The equipment has already been priced. We are in full faith that everything that we need, God is going to provide it for us. So it is for your house. Somebody say amen. If you're giving this morning, just type it on the screen when you've sent that seed in. I have sown. Just type those three words. Those three words. I have sown. Three simple words. I have sown. When you've done that, we're going to be praying for you as soon as we uh, finish this portion. And then Monday morning, bright and early Monday morning, Pastor Sharon is going to be back online praying and interceding for you. I got one more announcement for you. This New Year's Eve, we're not going to be at the 2024 North Maple Lo Lo North Maplewood location. We're going to be at the Gates of Refuge online location. The minstrels, the tech crew, uh, the, the singers, they are gearing up. They're working diligently. They have been working. Now nah, they, they get ready to work their fingers to the bone to make sure that on New Year's Eve, we're going to have a night of worship online. I want you to invite everybody you know when you see the flyer come on your page. Do me a favor and share it. Let's break the internet and we are going to lay out in the presence of the Lord and you're going to be able to watch it, experience it live from your home. Charge your phone up, charge your tablet up. New Year's Eve, that's December 31st, 7 p.m. We're going to be live uh, broadcasting to you a night of worship, and um, I am excited about it. Again, please be praying for them um, that all that they need, that God would give them the strength and everything that they would need to make this experience an anointed time in the presence of the Lord. All right, my voice is going out, but I love you. I hope that this message, I pray, go back and read the book of Romans in a plain version, and I promise you, it will revolutionize your, your relationship 
you will walk with the Lord. We've made this thing too, too difficult, uh, too, too tedious. And God wants to relieve um, the stress and the anxiety and the dissonance, the conflict between us and him so that we can get on to the rest of our life. There is a nation of people that are waiting on you to show up, but God's got to untie us. If you're typing in this in the comments, before you leave out of here, I want you to just say, God, untie me. God, untie my mind. God, untie my finances. It, come on. We pray, Father, right now that the anointing that is in this room, we release it to every man, to every woman. Father, that you would untie it. Tamaska, the weight and the sin that so easily be set up. Father, untie us from works, untie us from a performance-based gospel. Father, untie us from every religious doctrine that we have learned that has us bound, that has us tied up. We're asking you to send the breaker's anointing. Father, I thank you that every ministry gift that is under the sound of